Hey, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to True Crime Wednesday. For those of you who might just be joining us for the first time, my name is Lori Hellis. I'm a retired criminal uh, attorney, and uh, I am under contract with a publisher to write a book about the Vallow Daybell case. Let me just turn my ringer off on my phone. Um, and uh, so welcome if you are here with us for the first time. I know we do have some new viewers. Thanks to our uh, my appearance on uh, Surviving the Survivor. Um, <clears throat> for those of you who also follow Surviving the Survivor, <clears throat> excuse me, Gigi McKelvey from Pretty Lies and Alibis and I were supposed to be on with Joel on Monday. Unfortunately, Joel had a family emergency, which turned out to be uh, awful and tragic. His father was rushed to the hospital and later in the day passed away. So we are sending our major condolences to Joel and his family, to his mom, Carm, and uh, to his whole family. So please, if you, uh, if you have a minute, send some good thoughts their way. We are going to talk tonight pretty much exclusively about the Vallo Daybell case, even though that's usually our Friday gig, because the trial is starting on Monday. And we had a surprise hearing today. And since everybody's here now in, uh, in Ada County in Boise, I was able to attend the hearing this morning. And we're going to talk all about what happened at that hearing. So, but before we do that, while we're waiting for folks to join us, uh, I just wanted to make a couple of quick announcements. First of all, for those who are in the Boise area, please join us for Pizza and Chat <clears throat> next Tuesday, uh, April 4th, uh, at the Smoky Mountain Pizzeria Grill, and that is in Meridian. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the area, please join us. Um, I hope that we're going to have a couple special guests. Uh, I think Gigi is going to join us, and we've invited Scott Reich uh, if he is uh, here. I know he's talking about coming, although he also was complaining that he had uh, he was having his airplane doing some major. Um, uh, service on his airplane. I don't think it's ready yet. So we'll see when he's able to get here, what his schedule's like, and when his uh, Crime Talk 1 might be available. But please do join us if you're going to be in the local area. Now, I just wanted to um, familiarize folks who may not be as familiar uh, with the case as I am or some of you all are. Because I know that we do have new people joining us now that we're getting closer to the trial. So for those of you who don't know, this is Lori Vallow. This is her latest mugshot. Um, uh, lots of people uh, had some concerns that uh, maybe the makeup that you get out of the uh, canteen isn't as good as some of the stuff she's accustomed to because the makeup looks a little rough. Here she is in a picture dressed in her flak jacket coming in and out of court. Uh, up in the left-hand corner is her husband and co-defendant, Chad Daybell. Uh, he is husband number five for Lori. Uh, and he is also her, uh, she believes that he is a religious prophet. So he is her husband and prophet. And the lower picture is Lori's two children, on the left is there her daughter, Tylee, uh, I'm sorry, on the right <laughs> in the blue sweatshirt is her daughter, Tylee, on the left is her uh, son, JJ. Now, Lori has, <clears throat> sorry, allergy season, this is me medicated. Um, Lori has, uh, a, her family tree is a little bit complicated. Lori was married to fourth husband, Charles Vallow, and um, his sister, Kay Woodcock, Kay Vallow Woodcock, um, 
her son and his girlfriend had a baby. They were unable to take care of the child because of some prolonged and pretty persist persistent drug problems. Kay and her husband took the baby in right out of uh, right out of the hospital when he was born. And um, but it, they had him for uh, I believe he was about 18 months when when um, Charles and Lori said, why don't we adopt? They still had Tylee at home. Um, why don't we adopt JJ? And everyone agreed that that was a great option. They were living in uh, in the Phoenix, Arizona area. There were a lot of great services. By this time, I think they knew that JJ was going to have some um, learning deficits or some um, some other handicaps. And so it, it seemed like at the time that it would be a great alternative. So Lori and Charles Vallow adopted JJ when he was about 18 months old. Um, at that point, and this is going to be important with what we're going to talk about today. Uh, at that point, Kay's son, JJ's biological father's parental rights were terminated and legally he became the child of Charles and, and Lori. So that is going to become important when we talk about what happened in court today. One of the other people that you're going to hear us talk about, I don't have a picture up of Colby Ryan, but we'll, we're going to talk about him as well. But one of the other people we're going to talk about is Summer Shiflett. She is Lori Vallow's youngest sister. Lori was one of five children. Um, there were three girls and two boys. The oldest girl, Stacy, passed away when she was about age 31 from complications from type 1 diabetes. And uh, Summer is the youngest of the five children. And that's Tylee with her. So... <clears throat> we, we just are chatting about those things because um, this is Kay and Larry Woodcock, and that's JJ in the middle. Um, Kay is uh, Charles Vallow's sister, and Larry is her husband. Uh, they were the ones who were uh, initially were caring as, uh, as relative foster parents for JJ before he was adopted by Lori and Charles. So let's talk about what happened today. Today what happened was there was a there was a um, surprise hearing that was scheduled today. We heard yesterday and early this morning that the the hearing was primarily procedural, but we didn't really know what that what what that could entail. So I hightailed it down to the courthouse, which I was really glad I did for a number of reasons. Um, I saw some of our fabulous followers there. Uh, and I also got the chance to sort of scope out the courthouse and make sure I knew where the best parking was going to be and all of those things. So I plan to go and do that tomorrow, um, but got the chance to do it today. So it's one more thing that's ticked off my to-do list. So um, at the hearing today, when we got there, we discovered now Lori was present with both her lawyers um, and um, the district attorney, uh, Lindsay Blake, was there along with uh, district attorney, his special counsel, uh, Rob Wood and um, Rachel Smith. They were all there. And... Um, so we all got in the courtroom. Uh, things started a little bit later than they had originally planned. There appeared to be some discussion going back and forth with uh, with Jim Archibald and John Thomas going up and down the hall to see their client. And then when the, the audience folks were let in, Lori was seated at counsel table with her attorneys. Prosecution were seated at counsel table. Now, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how the courtroom is set up because uh, that sort of plays into how many people can get into the courtroom. 
as you all know, Judge Boyce, who is presiding over the trial, has ordered that there will be no live stream, no cameras at all in the courtroom. So no still cameras, no video, no recording of any kind. And um, East Idaho News and a couple of the other news outlets have set up a, uh, have arranged to have a sketch artist, a pool sketch artist. So everybody involved will have access to that sketch artist's images, but that'll be the only images coming out of the courtroom. Now, what the court did order, because there, it's anticipated that there'll be more people interested in attending than are, are uh, that there's room in the courtroom. Uh, the, co the courtroom itself holds about 75 people. We don't know how many of those seats are going to be available to the general public and how many are going to be reserved for witnesses, family members, all of those things. But there's another 250 seats in an overflow courtroom. What the court is doing is transmitting from the main courtroom to this overflow courtroom closed circuit um, images, closed circuit uh, TV. Now, those video images are going to be transmitted to the second courtroom, but they are absolutely not going to be recorded or stored in any way. They are contemporaneous uh, transmissions. So there's no saving them, storing them, getting them later. The other thing that the judge has ordered is that that same live feed be transmitted to a courtroom in Rexburg in Madison County so that people, um, people, citizens of Fremont and Madison County who are the taxpayers paying for at least part of this uh, have the ability to watch it in, in their local area. But there have been requests that have been um, <clears throat> made by family members, particularly uh, Tammy uh, Daybell, Tammy Douglas Daybell's parents uh, in, in particular, had asked to be able to get that live feed because they're in poor health and living in Utah. And the court has denied any other um, has denied any witnesses appearing by closed circuit or by video conference and has denied anyone watching the trial. So anything being transmitted in or out of the courtroom. So all witnesses are having to appear in person. They're not being permitted to appear by video conference. And all anyone who is watching the trial has to be present either at the Ada County Courthouse or at the, the Madison County Courthouse in Rexburg. So um, beyond that, sorry. Um, so the next question is who can be in the courtroom? And that was really the bulk of the conversations that were had this, this morning in court. Now, it was a little hard for me to understand who brought this up. It appears that the court brought it up. Um, when I went back through the court database, there are no motions. Neither side has filed motions about, uh, about witnesses. It is typical for witnesses to be excluded from the courtroom until they testify. Once they've testified, they can be in the courtroom. But nobody wants witnesses to sit in the courtroom and listen to what everybody else has testified to before they testify. That's just, that's really part of the process. Now, for those of you who watched the Murdoch case, it was very odd, and a lot of people commented about the fact that witnesses were not excluded in the Murdoch case. And anybody who was going to be a witness in the case was allowed to sit in the courtroom. That's very strange. And a lot of people commented on the fact that it was unusual um, to allow witnesses to continue to sit in the courtroom and listen to what everybody else was testifying to. Much more typical to have witnesses excluded from the courtroom. So, um, <clears throat> 
it appears that the judge asked uh, for their a, a conversation about excluding witnesses. And um, while we were there, the judge really went over the law. So I'm going to put up a little slideshow here because I know you guys all count on me to explain the legal part of things. And I know there are a lot of people very upset about this. And I understand. I'm merely going to explain to you what the judge said during the trial or during the hearing this morning and the reason for the questions. So let's talk a little bit. Whoops. Got to get back to the beginning here. Um, when can witnesses be excluded? And the statute that um, that controls that in Idaho is Idaho Statute 1953.06. So I wanted to take a little bit of a look at what the law says. And it's a little confusing because we typically think about a, a statute being written sort of from the most important point to the next important point to the exceptions. So we we think of a statute as being written from the, the big picture to the more specific, and that's the way a statute's usually written. In this case, it jumps around a little bit, and I do think it creates some confusion. So let's start with the law says that the definition of a victim, victim, now the victims in this case are JJ, Tylee, and Tammy Daybell. They're the victims in this case. Victim is an individual who suffers direct or threatened physical, financial, or emotional harm as the result of the commission of a crime or a juvenile offense. So obviously they suffered uh, direct physical harm as a result of the crimes. So the next piece is that it says the provisions of this section, meaning that statute, will apply equally to the immediate families of homicide victims. In other words, the immediate families of homicide victims are also categorized as victims for the purpose of the law. Now that's important because sometimes we say, oh, well, the families are victims and, and that is accurate. But what the law actually says is that <clears throat> Victims are defined as people who are harmed by the criminal activity. And those, the, the um, fam, immediate families of the victims, if they are homicide victims, are also considered victims. So who's in the immediate family? Well, the statute is not clear. The, the law that's written is not clear about who is actually immediate family. So we have to look at case law. So there's some cases out there that determine this. Now, I'm going to whip through this pretty quickly. You can pause this and read it in depth if, if you all want. But essentially, what the because the legislature did not define immediate family, other places, other statutes do define immediate family as parent, mother-in-law, father-in-law, husband, wife, sister, brother, brother-in-law, sister-in-law, son-in-law, daughter-in-law, or son or daughter. So spouses, parents, siblings, and their, in, uh, and their married partners. Further later, this, uh, that, uh, State v. Payne kind of outlined that. And then in 2008, and then later in 2013, State versus Shackelford quoted State versus Payne 
and um, noted that the immediate family includes spouses, children, siblings, and their married partners. So the people immediate family does not include are grandparents, aunts and uncles. So in the discussion that was held, um, Jim Archibald made the argument that it, 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 he quoted to Idaho adoption law, but the truth is um, the adoption law is the same across the, across the country. And that is that when Kay's son, uh, when his parental rights were terminated, the law says that an adoption is as if that child were born to the adopted parents. So that is the legal standing for the adoption. So once the adoption was completed, Kay's son's parental rights were terminated, meaning that all of the parental standing on that, it, that, that comes out of that those parental rights was also terminated. So relationships like grandparents and aunts and uncles, those are all terminated by the termination of the father's parental rights. And legally, the law looks at it and says, we are going to treat JJ as if he had been born to Charles, biologically to Charles and Lori. That is a universal, it's not just Idaho law, it's all all adoption law. Um, remember, JJ's adoption was finalized in in Louisiana because that's where Kay, Larry, and um, Kay's son all lived. So the the adoption was actually finalized in Louisiana. Doesn't really matter for these purposes because regardless dad's parental rights were terminated that also terminates the the parental rights of the grandparents and the aunts and uncles or states vary as to whether or not grandparents actually have their own discrete individual rights but in states where grandparent rights are recognized a uh, terminating dad's parental rights also terminates paternal grandparents rights so they're right. Archibald's accurate. He's right that a co under adoption law, um, those parental rights are, are terminated as well. So, but we do know that Kay and Larry always were, uh, JJ called them mama and papa. He called them grandmother and grandfather names they were considered, they filled that role of grandparents for him and to some extent for Tylee as well. So the question is, um, are they victims? Are they immediate family? And so do they, are they to be treated as victims? Now, Rob Wood says, uh, argues that the statute, and I'm going to slide back here. I don't want to give everybody whiplash, but I, I do want to I, I, I want to run back to this because um, Rob Wood says that because Kay and Larry suffered emotional harm as the result of the commission of the crime, that they should be considered victims. I, I have a little bit of trouble with that argument because, because victim is an individual who suffers direct physical or emotional harm as a result of the commission of the crime. The legislature, I think, intends for a victim to be the person who, who the crime was committed against. Um, so I think the victims in this case are JJ, Tylee, and Tammy. Because the legislature then goes on to say that the provisions of the section apply equally to the immediate families of homicide victims. So 
I, I think if you take those two together, you have to read into it that victim is the person the crime is committed against. And in the case where the victim has been murdered, then you have the immediate family of the victim also being treated as victims. Now, the reason that's important is because most states now, their, their, um, their con state constitutions include a provision for victims' rights. And victims do have certain constitutional, state constitutional rights that are outlined in the state constitution, including being able to give impact statements, being able to be advised at every step of the trial, being able to be consulted when, when there are plea negotiations. All of those are rights that are afforded to crime victims. Um, and, and if we start with that, then it makes sense that the person the crime was committed against is actually the victim. And in the case where the victim is ha, it has been murdered is a homicide victim, then the immediate families are also considered victims. If that's the case, then it then according to what I'm interpreting from the statute, Kane Larry and Summer Shiflet are not victims. Colby Ryan, who is Lori's son and is JJ's sib legal sibling and Tylee's legal sibling would be considered a victim. So before everybody gets all up in arms, I, I need to tell you that I see my role in all of this to explain what's going on in court. And so explaining what happened this morning in court is explaining to you what the controversy is. So Rob Wood is saying he believes Kay and Larry should be considered victims. Jim Archibald and company are saying they believe the law says that Kay and Larry are not, don't fall under that technical um, definition of victims. Now here's where it, it's important. Kay and Larry and Summer Shiflett and Colby Ryan are all on the prosecution's witness list. To, we found that out today at trial. Now, the witness lists, for the most part, have been sealed, which makes a certain amount of sense since we are attempting to have an, an orderly um, uh, an orderly case, and we're attempting to maybe protect those witnesses from um, being influenced ahead of time being, uh, whether it's negative or positive, being impacted by media coverage. So it made sense to have those witness lists sealed because witness lists always include the person's identity, sometimes their birth date, because the, uh, the other side is going to do background checks. They need that. And uh, also their addresses. So we don't want people, be they press or be they people who have an ax to grind in this case, harassing potential witnesses. But um, today, Rob Wood did announce that Colby Ryan, Summer Shiflett, and Kay and Larry Woodcock are all on the witness, the prosecution's witness list. So what the defense is saying is if they're on your witness list, they need to wait in the hall until they are called to testify. Once they're done testifying, they can come in and sit in on the whole rest of the trial, but they have to, they can only come in after their testimony is over because we don't want them sitting in the, we don't want any witnesses sitting in the courtroom and hearing what other witnesses or other evidence is. So it is, uh, I, it's going to be interesting to see what Judge Boyce decides. The prosecution asked for leave to submit written argument, and they were supposed to do that by the end of the day today. So I'm, I suspect that Judge Boyce is going to give, uh, is going to offer a, a written response probably tomorrow. Um, we're getting very close to trial, and these are decisions that need, need to be made pre-trial. 
If the judge determines that Kay and Larry are not immediate family for the purposes of the statute, what that means is Rob Wood will have to call them right away and get their testimony out of the way so that they can be in the courtroom. Prosecutors, well, lawyers in general, um, usually have a, a, a scheme for the way that they want their witnesses to unfold. They want to offer witnesses in a certain order, and they want their evidence to unfold in a certain way to tell a story that supports their theory of the case. So it may mean that um, it may mean that Rob Wood will have to take Kay and Larry out of order from what they had hoped to uh, to offer. I don't know that it's as I don't know that it's a really big deal. It's not really going to throw off their their uh, stride by that much, their pace by that much. Um, Kay and Larry are going to, or, or one or the other of them are going to testify that I'm certain Kay is going to testify about uh, how they tried to find, uh, they tried to communicate with JJ after Charles died. Um, they were having a lot of trouble reaching Lori. Lori wasn't letting them talk to JJ. They had one very short communication with JJ in late August. And that was the last time they talked to to uh, JJ. Lori wouldn't tell them where she was moving to. She moved. Suddenly they couldn't find her anymore. How Kay discovered that Lori was in Rexburg. How Kay called and asked for a welfare check. Uh, I mean, we've all heard that story. And I think that's the story that they're relying on Kay to tell to the jurors. So that being the case, that's pretty early in their story. And, and I don't know that it's going to put them off all that much um, in, order to, uh, in order to get Kay and Larry back in the courtroom. So worst case scenario is they would be out of the courtroom until they testify um, the prosecution would be able to put them on it fairly early in, in their case and then be able to get them back in the courtroom. Um, as far as summer Shiflet goes, uh, no one is particularly sure whether she would be there for the remainder of the trial. We have not heard whether um, any of Lori's family will be attending the trial to support her. Uh, everything we've heard is that they are likely not attending. Uh, and everything we've heard is that Colby probably will attend just for his, just to testify if he's called. Um, you know, it's a lot. It's a lot to expect that a person is going to come to Boise, Idaho for what could be four to eight weeks. And um, when they all have jobs and they all have other obligations, they all have other commitments. So um, it's not at all that surprising to hear that, that some of them or many of them will not be attending. We, um, we, of course, Chad's case has been severed. So we don't have any information about Chad's family. I am assuming that Chad's attorney will be there as much as he possibly can because he's going to want to see the evidence that's going to be put forth for Lori and figure out how that factors into his case coming up later this year. Um, Chad's uh, case has not been reset yet, and it appears that that's not going to happen until after Lori's trial is over. Um, I I don't think you can... I, I don't think you can make too much of uh, of how important it is going to be for Chad's case that he is seeing all of this evidence in advance. It's huge for him. Um, having the opportunity to preview all of the evidence, preview the state's argument, yeah, that's huge. So um, that is all going to be 
very interesting. Now, I know that on True Crime Wednesdays, we usually talk about other cases. And the cases that we are usually covering, there's not a lot going on in those cases right now. Koberger is just waiting for his preliminary trial in June, which I intend to attend. Um, since we have uh, the Vallow case, since we have the death penalty off the table, I suspect that her case is going to be shorter. Uh, we don't have to, I, I think jury selection is going to be much shorter. Uh, it originally was, they were originally saying it could be all of next week. I don't think it's going to be that all of next week. I think it's going to take two to three days, they will have a jury seated. And I think we could see opening arguments maybe Thursday or Friday. So um, there aren't a lot of other cases that are hugely going on right now. There's not a lot going on. I know the Paltrow ski trial is going on. I've been catching bits and pieces of that, but I have to tell you, it's a civil case. Um, I don't find those as exciting as um, that. Now, a lot of court watchers do, and a lot of court watchers really um, were intrigued with Johnny Depp and, and Amber Heard, and uh, a lot of people who were not court watchers became court watchers because of Depp and Heard, um, and I'm sure that they're quite interested in in Paltrow and um, and the ski accident. However. I, I do have one comment, and that is after watching Murdoch and what a competent trial it was, no matter what you may think about Jim Griffin and Dick Harpootlian, um, they were certainly competent and certainly prepared. Um, this Paltrow case is a little distressing as to how bumbling and how ill-prepared both sides appear. Um, it's kind of alarming and in a lot of ways feels for those of us in my profession, a little, I'm a little embarrassed for them. And, it, it, you know, you sit back and think Gwyneth Paltrow is worth millions. You, you mean to tell me that she couldn't afford um, better counsel? Yeah, pretty. Uh, I, I think their performance has been questionable. <clears throat> what I've seen of it. Uh, I did watch the, uh, both the defendant and Gwyneth Paltrow, or she's the defendant, both the plaintiff and Gwyneth Paltrow's testimony. Um, I thought they both did okay in some regards and in some regards sort of shot themselves in the foot. So I think they're on equal footing kind of there. Um, I think that there are some serious questions about whether or not um, there was, it, whether or not the plaintiff's story holds up, let's put it that way. But it's important to remember that they only have to prove it by 51%, more likely than not, because it's a civil case. So it's a much different standard. The jury's got to weigh all that evidence, but all they have to do is say it's more likely than not she ran into him and caused his injuries. Only by 51%. So um, the scale only has to tip slightly in order for him to prevail. So um, the judge had some good questions about whether or not there were certain basis uh, for uh, him to recover, whether or not they had proven certain negligent damages. Um, so it'll be interesting because it is possible that um, the jury could find that that she ran into him, but that his damages were nominal. So he could walk out with nothing anyway. So it will be interesting to see. So we're at the halfway point, and I 785 in chat today. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm super thrilled about this. I'm excited that y'all are interested in um, joining me and coming 
coming to me to find out what the truth is about the legal issues. So thanks for putting your trust in me. And um, thanks so much for joining us. Um, I think we're at a point where we're ready to take some questions. So if you have questions, please post them in the chat. And uh, Michelle and Brenda will get them put up on the screen. Hey, Grav Falls. I'm always curious about how people get their screen names. Uh, question, how the heck is Boyce going to try this case when he has been unable to make any decisions timely up to now? Seems like it will take forever since he takes everything under consideration. I think that's a good point. I think I've, I've pointed out from the beginning that I feel like Judge Boyce um, was very cautious and was taking everything under advisement before um, making rulings. We've, we saw in the last couple of hearings that he did make some bench rulings and some that he took under advisement. Um, judges are required to make really rapid fire rulings on evidence. And so I think you're going to see Judge Boyce pick the pace up a little bit as it comes to evidentiary rulings. So when, when a, an attorney objects, and, and the other side says, no, it, it, it's legal, it comes in under the rules of evidence, and the judge then has to make a call. Uh, a lot of times we say the judge is, he's calling balls and strikes. So I hope we're going to see Judge Boyce be a little bit more um, decisive about those things. I will say that I have felt in the past couple of months that Judge Boyce seems to have found his feet a little bit more and seems to have um, taken charge a little bit more and been a little bit less indecisive. So I do I do understand that there were a couple of really big issues that the judge needed to decide. And in those cases, I think he appropriately, took under advisement, such as taking the death penalty off the table. Those are big decisions, decisions that are going to be impactful when it comes to uh, appeals. So, I mean, every ruling in a trial can be appealed, but um, some are more weighty than others. So a decision to take the death penalty off the table, that was big. And the judge, I think, wanted to make sure that he had expressed his reasoning in going through the statute, going through the cases, looking at federal law, looking at law in other case, in other states, and really trying to pull together his rationale before making uh, making that ruling. Um, he was sort of making his record for the for the appellate court at some point. So I think we're going to see, as the trial goes along, we're going to see those evidentiary rulings come more often. We haven't seen those. We haven't seen lawyers stand up and object, and then the judge have to make a call about whether or not the rules of evidence apply. I, I think you're going to see Judge Boyce be able to react to those sorts of, of decisions in trial, um, but... I, I do agree that there have been times that I think he was overly cautious about taking things under advisement that probably could have been decided from the bench. So, but it will slow things down. Hi, Catlink. Question, why was the issue not dealt with years earlier? Could this have been avoided if Kay had been named guardian? JJ... Uh, JJ and even Lori called the Woodcocks' grandparents 11th hour travesty. Well, I'm not sure it could have been taken care of previously because until the until each side provides their witness list and we know who's on their witness list uh, and we know whether or not those witnesses are going to be excluded, um, it's not a call that, that the judge could have made in advance. Yes, potentially, if Kay had been named guardian, um, but you can only be named guardian of someone who's alive. So when Kay filed her 
petition to be appointed JJ's guardian, JJ was already deceased. Um, Kay filed those documents in, I want to say, late November, early December. And it made perfect sense at that point because she didn't know where JJ was. They were hoping that JJ was going to be found and she wanted to avoid him being in foster care for any period of time. So applying to be his guardian, had he been alive and been recovered, would have made sense because then the court could have immediately placed JJ with them and not had to go through the interim step of ha having him in a stranger foster care situation. So it made perfect sense at the time, but a guardianship can only, you can only be given guardianship over someone who's living. So technically it was never really an option for Kay to have been named J JJ's guardian um, from the time she filed the documents. Um, yes, you're right. She, Lori called the, the Woodcox grandparents. But if you look at the definition of who can, is considered immediate family under the statute, grandparents are not. Parents, siblings, um, and spouses, basically. So good question, though. Hi, Kim. Hi, Kim. Before I answer this question, I want to say thanks so much. Um, some of you might be new here today, so I'm just going to make sure that everyone knows. Um, I really appreciate it when folks give us a super chat because all of your donations uh, go directly to our moderators. Um, I don't keep any of them. At the end of the month, we tally it up and I split it among the moderators. And um, it's a huge blessing for them. And it's a huge blessing that I'm able to do it. So thank you for donating generously because it allows me to be generous. Um, and uh, I, I, I honestly believe that it does make a big difference for our moderators. So um, the only thing that I uh, happily uh, have subscribed to is buy me a coffee. So uh, that is in our chat and in our show notes down here. Um, so if you'd like to buy me a coffee, feel free. I'm a coffeeholic and I'm sure that as we get closer to trial, I'm going to need to cruise by Starbucks on the way to the courthouse. So, um, but other than that, your donations all just go directly to our mods. Um, there also is a provision for PayPal donations. Our uh, address is in the show notes. Um, the PayPal link is in the show notes. Our PO box address is in the show notes as well. Um, for those of you who would prefer to drop a check in the mail, and I appreciate that more than you can you, than you could imagine. Um, we do have people who'd rather put a check in the mail. So um, I appreciate being able to pass that on to our moderators. Now, back to Kim. Thank you, Kim, for blessing our moderators. How are the number of jurors decided six versus 12? This is a great question. Um, in most states, it depends upon the severity of the crime. So misdemeanors go before a jury of six and felonies before a jury of 12. Now, here is the part that's a little weird. There are still a few states my home state of Oregon in, in particular, that do not require unanimous juries in criminal cases. Um, there are, like my home state, um, it has been an issue that we have been trying to change for some time, but uh, at this point, there are some states that only require three quarters of the jury to vote for conviction. Idaho is a unanimous state, so uh, rest assured that 12 people will have to determine Lori's guilt or innocence. Um, I hope that there will be ample um, uh, alternates because we saw in the Murdoch case that they had started out with six alternates. And by the time the trial was over six weeks later, they only had one left. They had several that uh, contracted COVID and had to, had to leave because of that. They had several who 
when uh, initially when the jury was seated, they were told the trial was going to take three weeks. It took six. And there was at least one person who said from the beginning, if this trial goes beyond three weeks, I cannot continue um, for some really valid reasons. And so the judge in uh, Judge Newman in that case replaced that juror when it got to the three week mark. And then there were two, at least two other people. One was removed because she had had communication uh, and discussed the case outside of, of the courtroom, which is a no-no. You can't even discuss the case among your jurors, let alone with people outside. And uh, when it was discovered, the judge removed her from the jury panel. So um, I would hope that the that Judge Boyce, out of an abundance of caution, is going to appoint five or six alternates um, because they can get whittled away really quick. And having uh, not having enough jurors is automatically a mistrial. Nobody wants to retry the case. So, but six versus twelve is whether it's a six is for um, misdemeanors and twelve is for felonies. Vivian Hall, what about the fact that Charles gave Kay the insurance money so she could ensure that JJ was taken care of? Couldn't it be argued that Charles named Kay JJ's guardian by making Kay benefactor? Well, no, um, not at all. Um, you can name anyone uh as the beneficiary of a, of a life insurance policy. And that doesn't necessarily create a familial link between them. Uh, and it, legally, Kay did not become JJ's guardian just by Charles uh, naming her as the beneficiary on behalf of, of JJ. Now, in some instances, if you say, I, I want... Um, I, I want my sister to be the beneficiary. I, I want her, I want to leave my insurance to my children, but I want it to be in trust and my sister to be the trustee who decides how the money gets spent until my children are of, uh, until they're adults. That's a little different situation because then the sister as a trustee has a fiduciary duty to the beneficiary but that still does not create a guardian, guardianship, conservator uh, relationship. So uh, it would not have been enough for, for um, Kay to claim that she'd become JJ's guardian because Charles named her as the beneficiary. And as far as I can tell, Charles named Kay the beneficiary directly and did not make her a trustee for his children. So she had had control over making decisions for uh, what was going to happen with that money. Uh, I don't believe that it was it. She the money went to her as a trustee. Good questions, though. You know, it's interesting. I was talking to some folks about our chats and about um, the things that we talk about, and um, a, a lot of people have noticed how elevated our questions have gotten. So I take that to mean that you're learning a bit from our lives and, and learning a bit about the law. And uh, so we're, we're getting more in depth and more elevated questions. So thanks. It means I'm doing my job and y'all are enjoying it. Hi, Lori Merez. I was listening to the hearing and Archibald said they were not planning on calling witnesses. Did I hear that correctly? Um, what Archibald said was he did not know how many, if any, witnesses they would be calling. And that is a very typical uh, st strategic kind of comment from a defense attorney. Um, defense attorneys are not going to want to telegraph how many witnesses they're going to call or who those witnesses are going to be. So that was more of a sort of tactical answer to say, I, I don't know if we're going to call how many, if any, witnesses we're going to call. Because remember, 
that the defense does not have to call any witnesses. The defense does not have to put on a case. It is the prosecution's job to prove beyond a reasonable doubt with the evidence that is available that, that the defendant committed the crime. If the defense puts on um, witnesses, it is because they believe that they have witnesses that can poke holes in that beyond a reasonable doubt evidence. Now, Lori has, has, um, has filed a notice saying that she intends to, to um, bring up an alibi. And typically when you raise an alibi, you have to put some sort of evidence on as to what that alibi is. Now, the prosecution has said the notice of alibi wasn't filed in a timely way and shouldn't be allowed. The judge has not ruled on that yet. So it will be interesting to see as the case sort of unfolds, whether or not Lori is going to need to put on evidence of alibi. That would likely be through other witnesses, not likely through Lori herself. I still don't think Lori's going to testify, although I have a pound of Starbucks coffee riding on it. So we'll wait to see whether who who's right. Um, but I, it is um, it will be interesting to see whether or not there are witnesses, and if so, who they are. Uh, I think that if the if the uh, defense is allowed to put forth that alibi um, claim, then they're going to have to put on some witnesses to prove where she was when she, uh, and uh, um, to prove her alibi. La, Mes La Mesa Filipino Food Club. Okay. <clears throat> Question. Lori, I found it interesting that Rob Wood chose to mention Colby and Summer today when mentioning who should be seen as a victim and allowed to come. Does it mean Summer has come around? You know, I don't know um, if, if what you're saying is, do, do I think that Summer now believes that Lori is guilty? I, I don't know. But I, I do know that... Um, Rob Wood had a conversation with her that got recorded and that, that it may be that that's what he's um, attempting to introduce and he needs Summer there to talk about, yeah, that's her and, you know, to, to actually lay the foundation to introduce some of that recording. It, that could be possible. Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean that Summer's come around. Um, my understanding from just background folks, is that Summer and um, Lori's mom are still having phone contact with Lori in jail. Um, but I don't, as far as I know, nobody else in the family is. So it, it's a little hard to say at this point where Summer's at uh, in terms of her mindset because it could just be that Rob Wood wants to get that recording in and needs her to lay the foundation. So um, it could be nothing. She could be testifying to nothing more than that. Um, uh, there, there are, there's some, there are some text messages that were exchanged between Lori and Summer um, in Arizona that may be material. I, I don't know. Uh, but they were in the the Arizona uh, discovery dumps. So it's possible, although it seems to me that those text messages would go a lot more to deal with um, the Arizona charges and Charles' murder. Now, while we're putting up the next question, I do want to answer something which people have asked about, and that is the law in in Idaho versus Arizona when it comes to sentencing. So in Idaho, the only way that you get to life in prison without the possibility of parole is if you ask for the death penalty, if the state asks for the death penalty, and then the defendant either takes a plea 
for life in prison without parole or is convicted and and the mitigating jury finds reason not to impose the death penalty. Hopefully that's clear. But there is no other way to get to life in prison without parole. The maximum sentence in Idaho for murder, if the death penalty is not on the table, is life in prison with parole considered after 10 years. Now, does that mean that person's going to get parole? No, but it means that they can be considered for parole after 10 years. There is no provision at this point with the death penalty off the table for life in prison without a possibility of parole. But before everyone panics, there is a possibility that Judge Boyce can stack these convictions. So if if all three of the people who she is accused of murdering were killed in the same event in the set on the same date, their sentences for the purposes of sentencing would merge and they would all merge into a single concurrent sentence, meaning happening all at the same time. But because these crimes all occurred on separate discrete occasions, they can all be run consecutively. So it is possible, yes, she could get life with the possibility of, of parole after 10 years for Tylee and life without with the possibility of parole after 10 years for JJ and another one of those sentences for Tammy. But if they are served consecutively, then she would have to serve 10 years for JJ and then her 10 years would start for Tylee and then her 10 years would start for Tammy. So technically she would have to serve 30 years before she would be eligible for parole. The judge could also stack some of the other charges, the conspiracy charges, the murder charges, the, the um, theft charges, those could all stack up. So before anyone panics that she could potentially be paroled in 10 years, I don't see that happening. I believe that the judge will likely stack those consecutively so that she will, for for all purposes, serve a, a life without parole sentence and she'll die in prison. Other people have asked about the death penalty, whether or not the death penalty could still be sought in Arizona on those charges. In Idaho, conspiracy to commit murder carries the same sentence as murder. So the death penalty was a possibility in those conspiracy charges. In Arizona, it's not that way. Conspiracy to commit murder carries a maximum of life in prison with 25 years before you can seek parole. So I think from a practical standpoint, um, she is likely going to die in prison but uh, it is possible that the that the judge could stack all those and and make sure that she stays in prison for life. And I think that's what would hap will happen. I would be very surprised if the judge said, yes, you can be eligible for parole in 10 years. So um, I just wanted to get that out there while I was thinking about it. Why, hi, Kresha. Nice to see you in chat. I understand that... Um, I, I my heart goes out to the family because I do understand that um, that it feels like a slap in the face. And I, I cannot disagree with you on that. And I, I really I do empathize with the family. And I know um, I, I heard uh, earlier today that Kay and Larry were very upset and understandably so. They have been really the, the stalwart, valiant uh, fighters for justice for, for all three of the victims here in Idaho. And if it had not been for uh, Kay, Kay's tenacity, we probably would not know to this day what happened to the children. So I, I can understand how it feels like a terrible slap in the face. And I am 
hoping against hope uh, that uh, I will get the opportunity to give Kay and Larry both a big hug um, starting next week. Just three goldens. I hope those are golden doodles or maybe golden retrievers. Um, if Lori is sentenced to life in prison, but given the death penalty in Arizona, will one override the other? Okay, well, this is a good question, but um, she's not eligible for the death penalty in Arizona because conspiracy to commit murder does not carry the death penalty. The maximum sentence is, is life with 25 years before parole. But it is interesting to think about what, what will take priority. So I've said from the beginning, I'm certain the prosecutors, prosecution in Idaho has been talking to the Arizona prosecutors since before the Arizona charges were ever brought. I'm sure that um, as they've gone along, they've kept everybody up to date on, on what's been happening. And I'm certain that now remember, Lori has not even been arraigned on the Arizona charges. So her speedy trial rights on those charges don't start to run until she's been arraigned. So I'm certain what will happen is she will be um, she will be adjudicated here. So she'll get to the end of her trial here. There'll they'll be a verdict. And then uh, if she's found guilty, then she will receive a sentence. So it's likely um, that it could take a month or two before Judge Boyce imposes a sentence. Um, we don't know. The judge is required to wait two days to impose a sentence. Now, what the judge determines he's going to do, I don't know. Typically in Idaho, what happens is um, there's a pre-sentence uh, evaluation done uh, and and the pre-sentencing evaluation is completed that sort of looks into all of the, it, it's sort of like a mini mitigation, although it's done by the state, usually by parole and probation. So it's a, it's not necessarily as un, or, or, or defendant heavy as a mitigation uh, case would be. And then that's presented to the court and then the court determines sentencing. We don't know whether the judge is going to require that, how long it would take and, and whether or not um, the judge will sentence right away. If the judge says, I want to sentence in a week, it's likely Lori would stay in Ada County. Everybody would stay, stick around and they would have a sentencing hearing. If it's going to be a month or two while a pre-sentence report is generated then you could see Lori going back to Fremont or uh, back to Madison County to the Madison County Jail, and Judge Boyce then sentencing her once all of that pre-sentence report is done. It's a little hard to say at this point. Once that is all done, she will be transported to Arizona, and in Arizona she will be arraigned, and it will be determined what happens next. She could be held in Arizona pending trial. They, on the other hand, they could come up with a plea arrangement based on the fact that she's already serving a lengthy sentence in Idaho. So they could come up with a plea arrangement that they could say, okay, we're going to agree to life in prison with 25 years as a possibility for parole. What that would mean is that Lori would then have to go to Arizona and serve that sentence before she could be released. So even on the outside chance, uh, I mean, what could have, what's the worst that could happen? They could plead it down to uh, a lower like murder in the second degree and Lori could plead guilty to it and they could impose a sentence, which in Arizona would be, life with the possibility of parole after 12 years. So what would happen is she would have to serve her 10 years on each one of those sentences in Idaho. And after she'd served 30 years, she would still have to serve another 12 years in Arizona before she would be eligible for parole. So uh, I mean, I think it's very unlikely she is ever going to get out of prison, but um that is the facts. 
Hi, Sarah. It's nice to see you, Sarah. I'm glad to see you back in the chat. I know that you kind of had a rough time, um, had some family stuff going on. And so it's nice to see you back on your feet. Uh, how about how their client is allegedly a family annihilator, thus changing family dynamics in poor taste to say she was never a grandmother? Well, I, I think that it is very possible that, um, well, I think it's true that Lori meets the criteria for being a, a family annihilator. Um, and that certainly did change the family dynamics. And, you know, I, I think that it's important to sort of separate out the emotional response from the, the, the legal response. I empathize entirely with Kay and Larry. I absolutely do not question for a moment that Kay and Larry were JJ's grandparents. Uh, that is, I would never, I, I would never bring that into question. But y'all rely on me to explain what happens in, in, in the courtroom. So yes, Jim Archibald made that legal argument because he's the defense attorney and that's his job. And sometimes you have to make legal arguments that are distasteful. And sometimes you have to make legal arguments that you personally may not believe in, but are supported in the law. So I'm not going to hold that against Jim Archibald. I don't know whether Jim Archibald thinks Kay and Larry are grandparents or not, but he is obligated to zealously represent his client and to make the arguments um, that support that zealous representation. So he's there today and he's saying under the law, Kay Woodcock is not a legal, uh, is not an, a, a victim, an immediate family victim. Whether she's considered a grandparent or not, she still doesn't fall within, even if she, even if we say Kay's grandma, she still doesn't fall within that immediate family parameters because that are spouses, um, parents, and and children. So she doesn't she doesn't qualify. Um, does that mean that she doesn't have a, a a deep emotional relationship with JJ? Absolutely not. I mean, there's no question in anybody's mind that Kay and Larry had a deep connection with JJ, um, but. Jim Archibald is required to zealously represent his client. And that means he's required to make those arguments, even if he personally thinks that, um, that Kay is, is JJ's grandmother. So um, a lot of folks have said, oh, we just think that it's Lori hates Kay and she doesn't want her in the courtroom. I'm not really sure that that's true. Although I think that probably plays into it. I think from, Lori's perspective as she's talking to her lawyers, I'm sure she's saying, hey, I, it's okay with me if they're not in the courtroom. I don't like them anyway. But I don't know that that is the, the real legal underpinning of the, the argument for and against. Um, but if you look at the case law that we were looking at earlier in the slides, those issues have gone to the Supreme Court before. So it's important for Lori's attorneys to make their record and, um, and, and make sure that they're preserving all those arguments for, for appeal. Otherwise, they could be accused of, of providing ineffective assistance of counsel. So, you know, it's, you're always on a little tightrope there, always on the razor's edge, trying to, you know, trying to navigate these things as defense account, defense counsel. And um, that's why y'all come and talk to me. So how about next question? Christina, thanks for your donation. I appreciate it. Do Kay and Larry have to do the reservation system to be at the trial once they testify since they legal, they're legally not close family? No, no, not at all. They have already been told that they will have a, a, a seat in the courtroom every day. And so, no, they're not going to be required to do the reservation system like us. So, um, 
no, uh, Kay and Larry won't. Any of the other family members that are there to support the uh, to support Lori won't. And um, the sketch artist is being uh, guaranteed that that he or she will have a seat in the courtroom. The rest of us news people are going to be and and media people are going to have to do that the same as anybody else that wants to get into the into the trial. And uh, it was interesting talking to court security day. He said, you know, if you, it, the court has said that people cannot come and go in and out of the courtroom while the trial is going on. They can only come and go at, at breaks. Um, and if you leave, you can't come back in until the next break. Um, but that's not the case at the overflow uh, in the overflow venue because you won't be disturbing courts. So I, I suspect a lot of media people are going to want to be in that second overflow courtroom. The other thing is that they have said that they will have cameras, one on the, the judge and the witness stand, one on counsel tables. And so you will be able to see more reactions than you would if you're sitting in the gallery, because if you're sitting in the gallery, really, you're probably just going to see the backs of people's heads. Now, I will say that um, today, uh, the table where Lori was seated was um, kind of perpendicular to the gallery, and the the uh, prosecution's table was parallel, so you could see their backs. But um, the Lori's table was sort of on that perpendicular where you could sort of look over and, and see her sitting at the table. So I don't know what that's, how the courtroom is going to be configured once the trial starts, but if it, if it continues to be that way, then you will have a view of, of her and her reactions to what's going on on the stand. Um, but certainly. Hi, Bridget Sweeney. I was told that Lori and Chad's marriage was not filed in Hawaii. Can they be compelled to testify for or against each other? So their marriage certificate, which was filed and was um, and uh, was produced during Chad's preliminary hearing, a certified copy of their marriage certificate that was filed in Hawaii was produced in the preliminary hearing. So I don't think there's any question that they... Uh, that they had a legal, valid marriage and a marriage license in Hawaii. That was um, their marriage certificate, JJ's, uh, uh, Charles's death certificate, JJ's adoption documents. They were all brought into court during Chad's preliminary hearing. And um, they were all uh, received because they were copies that were certified by the the issuing agency. So I'm not sure there's any question that they were not filed in Hawaii. Husbands and wives cannot be compelled to testify against each other, except that in Idaho, there is an exception. And that exception is if the, the evidence that's being sought has to do with the abuse or neglect of either of the partner's minor children. So in this case, it has to do obviously with the abuse of JJ to the point of his death. And um, so that, that they couldn't claim uh, marital privilege for that because there's an exception to it. So regardless of the state of their marriage, they, they wouldn't be able to claim the privilege. Um, the other interesting issue is now that the cases are severed, um, once Lori is adjudicated, she no longer has Fifth Amendment privilege, uh, right? And so um, she could be called as a witness in Chad's case. But because Chad hasn't gone to trial yet, he could not be compelled to testify against her because he would be able to invoke the, his Fifth Amendment rights. Hopefully that's clear. This is going to be great fun. I know there are a lot of people who have said this is not the kind of occasion that you want to have a party about, and you're probably right. But it, I will say that the silver lining to being involved in this tragic case has been the number of really wonderful people 
that I've met um, being involved in the case. And that um, I think other people would say the same, that the, the opportunity, especially during COVID when we were all so buttoned down, the opportunity to get to know other like-minded people has been really wonderful and has been a true blessing for those of us who've been involved in the case. So we're going to have a get together um, at a pizza place uh, in uh, Meridian, here in Meridian, Idaho, which is just the next town over from Boise. So any of you who are in the local area or coming into town for the trial, please join us. It is an open invitation. We have extended the invitation to um, Gigi McKelvey and pretty, her Pretty Lies and Alibis followers. We have extended the invitation to Scott Reich and anybody who follows Scott um, to join us. And we're all just going to get to know one another and um, enjoy a little bit of social time. Um, because we have the best followers ever. So I want to agree, you know, we've run about 20 minutes over. Usually I try and finish right on time, but um, we've had a lot of great questions tonight. And we've had, we have 876 people in our chat tonight. That is the most we've ever had. And I want to thank everyone for being here. Um, I do, as Michelle points out, get up in the morning with coffee and sit down and review all of the chat, as well as all the comments that you post below. If you have a question that you'd like to ask and you're not, not comfortable posting it in our comments down below, email me um, and our emails in the, in, in the show notes as well. Um, I answer every question. Um, and I try and do them as promptly as possible. So uh, no guarantees once the trial starts next week. It may be a little slower getting to them, but I, I will uh, absolutely try. I want to do one last reminder, and that is that our schedule is going to change. Um, our schedule has been Wednesday night, True Crime Wednesdays, and then Friday nights, we talk all things Vallow. Um, but next week, that is going to change because of trial schedule. So starting next week, I am going to be posting short YouTube shorts. Um, we're going to try and get those up on both Instagram and Facebook stories in case you're not a YouTuber. And uh, we'll be doing as many, I'll be doing as many of those during the day as I can at breaks from court lunchtime right after court lets out. And then on Saturday, we're going to do a two-hour recap um, of what's happened during the trial week. And we're going to start with that. If it seems like we're still not getting enough coverage, then we may need to add some, uh, some other times. But with being in court all day, I'm sort of limited as to how much uh, time I can, um, I, I can do uh, on in the evening. So once again, I want to thank everybody for being here. 856 people in the chat, please push the like button because it makes a big difference um, in our algorithm. Also, if you are not subscribed, please subscribe and hit that notification button because we are going to be doing things a little more unscheduled than we have been. And you'll want to know when those when those posts come up. So Thanks again, everybody, for being with us tonight. I'm excited to, um, to talk on Friday of, as we run up to the trial. And then um, we start jury selection on Monday morning and we're off to the races. So stick with us for the best coverage from the courtroom. We're going to be live tweeting from the courtroom. We're going to get all those links out to everybody. So please stick with us. I'm going to say good night and I'll see you on Friday.